It's a great pleasure for me today to introduce Naomi Hirose of Tokyo Electric Power Company. Naomi graduated Hitotsubashi University in 1976. And as you know, Hitotsubashi is one of our partner schools. He then joined Tokyo Electric Power Company and spent several years there and then came to SOM and graduated with an MBA in 1983. He was a star student in my operations class. <laughs> and because he was such a star student, I asked him and he accepted the position of teaching assistant for the next year. And I got to know him very well, both in the classroom, outside of the classroom as well. And we became really good friends, and we've kept in close contact over all of these many years. He spent his whole career, after graduating from SOM, at Tokyo Electric. Almost all of that career was spent in the marketing area. And I have to tell you, you know that I'm an operations professor. It made me a little bit disappointed. <laughs> that he was spending so much time in marketing when I know he was such a keen and talented person in the operations area. And so in, in 2010, he, beca he, became, he became a managing director and a member of the board of directors. And I was extremely happy that that occurred. And then in 2012, he was named president of Tokyo Electric Power Company. And so now he has responsibility for operations, so I'm extremely pleased that that's finally happened <laughs> after all of these years. And I can't think of anyone who's better suited to lead the company at this time because of his calm demeanor, intellectual capacity, and tremendous personal skills He's the ideal person to lead the company at this time. I'm proud of all that he's accomplished, and I'm extremely proud to call him my friend. Let's welcome back Naomi Hirose to SOM. Well, thank you, Art, for your kind introduction. My name is Naomi Hirose. Um, as, as he introduced, I'm class of 83. Um, it's my great pleasure to be back here in New Haven. And I'd like to thank SOM for providing me uh, this opportunity to speak to you uh, today in this brand new building. Uh, this is, of course, this is my first time to be in this building. And this is a very, very nice and sophisticated. Although I rather miss the old building on Prospect Street, <laughs> where I learned a lot uh, 30 some years ago. Well, uh, it's been uh, almost, I would say, more than four years since the accident of uh, Fukushima nuclear power plant. I know um, there is still great interest in what happened there and in what we are doing to recover from the accident. Um, so I'd like to share with you the story of Fukushima today. Uh, actually, we made uh, great progress amid equally great challenges. And uh, the story of our recovery doesn't often uh, get out as much as we would like, and uh, challenges which are managerial, technical, and financial are more complex than many people actually realize. Uh, but the story of our recovery is not confined to Fukushima itself. It extends uh, all of our TEPCO's um, activities, as, as a company, uh, to fully recovery, we need to 
uh, do much, much more than uh, comp uh, decommission of nuclear power plants. We have to supply electricity for 30 million customers and operate more than 100 generating units and extensive distribution system and also already ourselves to compete in deregulating market. But I think um, as a member of SOM, I think you are probably in a very special position to uh, appreciate uh, the central challenge that we face uh, to develop then execute a vision for the future for our stakeholders at the same time executing a remedial program which will extend decades and requires technologies as yet uninvented costs an unimaginable amount of money and is filled with danger and uncertainty. So what I would like to uh, share with you today is some sense of how we are approaching these multiple objectives and how we uh, believe the lesson we are learning from the accident will be of, will be of value to you and others. I strongly believe that the accident and the lesson that we learn from the accident will make nuclear power safer in Japan and around the world. And then also strongly believe that lessons, there are broader lessons of value to managers, whether they work in nuclear power plants or Silicon Valley or Wall Street or anywhere else. So let's begin uh, with uh, uh, what happened uh, four years ago. Uh, I suspect that most of you know the basics of what happened in Fukushima four years ago. Actually, Art led 30, 40 students uh, visiting Japanese factories and Japanese company. Though you are in Tokyo, and uh, that, that was, you know, you know the, the earthquake actually continues, I would say, three, four minutes. It's a huge earthquake. You know, the, we, we get used to the earthquake, Japanese people. But uh, this was a big. As, as you see, uh, its magnitude of 9.0. The recent earthquake happened in Nepal is the size of 7.8 or something like that. So 9.80 is, is huge. And uh, this is, of course, at the historical record. And significantly larger than the maximum anticipated when the Fukushima and nuclear plants were designed. So as this photo shows, um, devastation in the area uh, was terrible. And nearly uh, 30, nearly 20,000 people lost their lives, um, particularly by tsunami, as you see. These are, you know, probably you've seen th these pictures. This is the devastating tsunami. You know, 45 minutes after the earthquake, actually, tsunami struck uh, our power plants. Uh, you see that the tsunami came from this side to, you know, swamp all the reactors. There are six units in Fukushima. And uh, uh, plant lost uh, the important ability to uh, cool their reactors and spent fuel pool. And uh, consequently, they partially uh, melt down of the nuclear fuels and in unit one, two, three. These are, the, look, look at these tsunamis power, you know, I'm oh, sorry. The, the, the tanks here somewhat moved, you know, separately and then twisted like this. Oh, it's, it's huge. And then 
the tsunami swamped everything, diesel and then batteries that, that would have provided power to uh, the reactors. And consequently, uh, partial meltdown and then hydrogen uh, explosion took place. Now please do, do remember, this is not nuclear explosion. This is hydrogen explosion. You know, hydro, hydrogen was produced in the response of the uh, metal, uh, which is a cover of the fuel, nuclear fuel. It's, it's zero core, and then it's oxided, and then uh, emit um, uh, hydrogen. Uh, so, but it was through the heroic efforts of TEPCO employees and the other first responders that the situation brought under control. Remember that these responders had to negotiate the roads and the situation uh, that were heavily damaged both by tsunami and then the earthquake. Many of them didn't know whether they are own houses are still standing, whether their own families are still alive. So we are, I'm very proud of their uh, effort. And however, um, this, explosion, this explosion led to the release of the radiation that, uh, as you've seen in these photographs, uh, spread in a plume roughly to uh, northwest, because the wind came from uh, south uh, east. But the Im impact of the surrounding community uh, has been great. As you see these uh, graphs, there have been evacuation, and then Tokyo Electric has to compensate all those damages, all the people who lost their livelihood, businesses, houses, and uh, uh, this you know, compensation in the left-hand side uh, graph shows that uh, almost 40 billion US dollar of compensation uh, we have already uh, spent to, the, to those uh, people who are evacuated. And that is, this is the largest single cost of anticipated cost associated with uh, the accident. Um, although it is certainly possible that the long-term costs of the cleanup will be greater as they will be incurred over 30, 40 years, year period. Let me take a, a few moments to explain the difference between the Japanese compensation law and that of the United States. As you see, Japanese laws differ in important ways from the U.S. The, the law called U.S. Price-Anderson Act. Um, in Japanese law, there is no liability limit, it says here. But of course, the U.S. Act, Price-Anderson Act has a, li a li liability limit. So the, the, the compensation may increase more and more as the damage continues. We also uh, make um, different efforts with the goal of allowing earliest homecoming as possible for as many people as possible. We are also making effort to revitalize Fukushima region, uh, devoting 145,000 day, person days uh, to cleaning their houses and snow shovering or weeding, you know, everything. So the people, employees of T Tokyo Electric voluntarily take days off and go to Fukushima and sweat and do the, these, those things. Uh, next, I'd like to touch upon the major achievement and the major challenges at Fukushima Nuclear Power Station. Now for the first several years after the accident, the most critical uh, technical challenge 
was to stabilize the site, cool down the reactors by an spent fuel pool by recirculating the uh, water. In those early days, it meant stabilizing a seriously damaging building. And um, you see the difference between two pictures. We have made great progress. The left-hand side is the, the, the picture right after the accident, and it's the present situation. This is the unit number three. It was very much damaged by the ex hydrogen explosion, but it's, it's getting uh, cleaner. And then unit number four, we made a great progress. Uh, we took out uh, all the fuel, spent fuel, from the spent fuel pool of the unit number four. Unit number four was probably, you have read a uh, false rumor in the internet saying that the, the rumor says that uh, in the building of unit number four uh, leaned and had, the building has had uh, cracks and then the, the water is leaking from the spent fuel pool. So people are really worried about uh, the removal operation. But uh, with, uh, with uh, careful uh, preparation, we did very much successfully. So there are over 1,500 fuel assemblies in the spent fuel pool in, at uh, unit number four. Because the unit number four was not in operation when earthquake and then tsunami struck. So that uh, there was no fuel assembly in the reactor of the unit number four. Instead, uh, more than 1,500 fuel assembly was sitting uh, in spent fuel pool, which is about uh, four story above the building. So, so we took out all the assemb as fuel assembly successfully. Um, here is a, the picture, how we going to remove the fuel debris from the, at least one of the three units, unit one, two, three, uh, by year 2020. It sounds far away, uh, but it, in fact, it is very ambitious a goal that we all require creativity, creativity, new technologies, and collaboration with our partners in Japan and in the US and around the world. Another challenge at Fukushima Daiichi is, is water, particularly groundwater. As I said, in order to uh, cool down the, the debris, uh, melted debris, we circulate the cooling water. But uh, the groundwater somewhat flows in to the building. You know, the, 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 the reactor building is surrounded by very thick concrete. But still, there are many, many pipes and then cables go through that thick wall. So from somewhere, we don't know where it is exactly, the groundwater flows in as much as 400 tons every day. 400 tons every day. So once it goes in, flows in into the building, it becomes contaminated because the inside of the building is contaminated. So as if this is a, this were the factory which is producing contaminated water every day. So in order to stop the flowing into the inflows of the uh, groundwater, we pump up, and uh, this is it, we pump up the groundwater before it reaches uh, the building and then release it to the ocean. And we also building uh, this frozen soil peri perimeter surrounding the building to shut, to shut out the groundwater flows in, in groundwater inflow. 
It, it is one mile long perimeter. So it's a huge pro project, but um, we have already <laughs> almost completed it, this uh, fro frozen soil perimeter. We started freezing uh, to make it more. And then also, uh, we, we, we are treating uh, already contaminated water by using uh, advanced reprocessing um, processing systems, which removes all the contaminants, nucleoid, except tritium. And we have to store a tritiated water until the, the decision is made uh, about the, the ultimate uh, disposal. But the number of the number of the tanks, as you see, <coughs> exceeded more than thousand. We have to store them until, you know, this is this is very, I would say, very clear water. It contains only tritium. But uh, for example, fishery people doing the fishing fishing business are very much worried about the release of this contaminated uh, tritiated water. So it it takes a long time to to have the public acceptance. And then, so this is a, this is a most one of the most challenging uh, uh, things. And um, and uh, as you see that uh, it is obvious that uh, Fukushima nuclear plant will will never generate another yen for uh, in revenue. You know, it is a cost center so-called. And as you see, that uh, this is our financial uh, position. As you see, this is a year 2000. Uh, it's a 10, a fiscal year. This is fiscal year. But actually, the, the accident took place here. So we made a, a huge loss deficit uh, for three years, three consecutive years. But uh, note that we had uh, two um, profit, we, ne we made profit for two consecutive fiscal year. So because of the, uh, because of the huge uh, cost cutting, we, we, we are doing, we are cutting cost almost everything. Look at this uh, figure. This is a, a fiscal four, nine, 2014, we just finished. Uh, our cost of, you know, reduction went 7.1 billion U.S. dollar for one year. It is a huge amount. So by doing so, we made a profit. But in order to um, make the profitable um, financial position continuously or sus sustainably, we need, we need to operate, restart another uh, nuclear power plant, which are located in the, the other side of Japan. So that's uh, um, one of the challenges that we are uh, coping with. And let me uh, conclude my talk by listing the, the lesson that we are learning from the accident. The first is uh, uh, safety things. Um, the, the, the accident has reminded us and also the, the global nuclear community that uh, safety cannot be uh, taken for granted. Uh, we are uh, diligently working not only to operate safely, but also uh, instill uh, safety culture, one in which our workers are empowered to have a uh, um, questioning attitude and anticipate the unexpected situation and emphasize safety over meeting schedule and design 
defense in depth uh, concept. The next lesson is the importance of communication. Right after the accident, we could not communicate as effectively as possible. We made a bad situation worse. Uh, and so we, are, uh, we have made a clear um, commitment to um, transparent and accurate and timely communication. It's, it is abundantly clear that uh, poor communication in the crisis will lead to um, a loss of public trust with that greater difficulty in operating every phase of the business. The, the next uh, lesson is benchmarking or the, the importance of collaboration of the outside organization. For example, uh, when you make a lot of effort to improve the safety, you might get complacent or arrogant because we, we did so much so, and this, this is already sufficiently uh, enough. We got safety. That's a really dangerous situation. So in order to avoid that happens, we better benchmark the excellence of the others. And then we know that uh, what kind of things we could do more to improve the safety. That's a very important thing. That, that, that's one thing that we have to learn from this accident. And also the building solidarity or to be united among the members of, of the company. Well, every one of Tokyo Electric Power has contended with salary cuts and uh, layoffs and even social ostracism. The children of ours had really bad, difficult time in their school because their parents are working for TEPCO. It's a really sad situation. So the, the, and, you know, these, these under these very difficult uh, circumstances, you know, getting together and have solidarity, building solidarity is very, very important. It's all, I would say, almost indispensable to cope with a different, a very difficult situation. And so I try to share my time with some, his member of TEPCO as much as possible. So I always visit um, branch offices and generating uh, plants to have a direct face-to-face -face communication and to share uh, with them the, the real situation, present situation, how difficult it is. But also we share the common goal or same directions. That's why the solidarity uh, is very, very important at the time of the difficult uh, situation. So any one of these uh, lessons uh, could be the subject of, of its own talk. But I, I wanted to give you uh, an appreciation of the fact that TEPCO is more than just Fukushima. With, even with those difficulty and challenges, I am rather optimistic. We have weathered the worst of the storm. And out of the storm, uh, out of the you know, difficulty, out of the disaster, that was Fukushima, we will come a company tested by extraordinary hardship and safer facility, a body of knowledge that can be shared with nuclear operators around the world. And then I also like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation for the assistance and support from the United States. Um, when we needed help most in the aftermath of the uh, March 11, United States stood with Japan. So we never forget this. Thank you very much. 
And our workers in Fukushima nuclear power plants were very much honored by a visit uh, from the ambassador, Caroline Kennedy, uh, about a year ago with her son, Jack. As you see, both of them wore the uniform, TEPCO's uniform, same uh, thing one we wear. And um, she gave a very um, encouraging speech to the workers uh, in Fukushima. We appreciate them very much. And uh, finally, I once again would like to appreciate uh, our workers who had made great pro progress under the very, very difficult situation, not only at Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant, but also at headquarters, at every branch offices. I'm very proud of being uh, their leader. Thank you very much. Okay, um, it's time for Q and A. Um, Hiroshi san, have a seat. Thank you. Um, questions? Questions? Yes. Mr. Hirose, thank you very much for your visit and for sharing your experience. As um, someone who was there for the Toho earthquake and in the weeks afterwards, mm -hmm. through the aftershocks and the rolling blackouts, and also I, I teach communication and crisis management in our environmental studies division, we had a project measuring radiation in the uh, in some of the areas around the, um, especially in Utsunomiya. And I'm curious about your communication lesson learned. You know, just yesterday we heard that Mount Hakone may be erupting soon, and there are obviously more crises coming to Japan. And could you tell more about the tension between being transparent and running a company in a way that is successful? Okay, okay. Uh, it's a good question. Well, before this accident, um, Regarding the nuclear safety, we kept saying this is 100% safe. You know, and um, so that the, the people, particularly local people where the, the nuclear power plant is uh, located, um, probably were relieved hearing oh, this is 100% uh, safe. But at, um, by saying that, it became very difficult for us to, uh, to change the facility because we had, we had said this was 100% safe. So if we start making some reform or changes or reinforcement of something, we have to explain them. We had to explain them. And then they asked, you know, this is a, this is a different story. Right? This, is, this is a different what I heard. So we kind of, um, we were hesitant to, to explain, you know, things. And then sometimes we didn't explain very precisely in, in order to do some work. But um, after the, the, the accident, yes, this is, a, this is much, much more difficult job to explain the local people, this is not 100% safe. It's really difficult. So you know that, well, I went to Fukushima and then I went to uh, other area where our power plants located. Now I have to explain that the evacuation program. People, you know, people doesn't like the story of evacuation. You know? Everybody doesn't like to hear that. You no, know, do I have to evacu being evacuated? 
that, that's a you know, very natural response. But we have to explain. Of course, we, did, we, we have done this and this, this and this, this and this to prevent the accident happen. But what if something really bad, unexpected happens? You have to be evacuated. That's a story. So it, it's, it is really difficult. It's much, much, much more difficult uh, than before when we just explained. This is 100% safe. So uh, we need to learn how to, um, how to explain. You know, it's, it's much, much more difficult. But still, we learn that uh, we, have to, we have to tell the truth. Not, not truth. We have to... You have to tell them that uh, we've got to anticipate the unexpected. So um, we have to learn more how to explain, how to let them understand this kind of the evacuation program is needed. Uh, you know. So uh, I don't know if I'm ask, uh, you know, answering the, the right answer to your question, but uh, it, yeah, it is. We changed you know, the way, way of the communication after the accident. It, it made us uh, much, much more difficult to have a communication. But still, we have to do that. If I could just follow up briefly. I think the challenge was the bad news and how much radiation was coming down on these farms. Mm -hmm. And the farmers wanted to know. Mm -hmm. Could I eat this food? Can I sell this mm -hmm. food? And mm -hmm. we got some numbers from TEPCO, mm -hmm. and there were some other measurements going mm -hmm. on as well. And I guess, how do you see the future in terms of sharing your data mm -hmm. with these communities? Mm -hmm. and when, at what stage of the crisis might that sharing mm -hmm. occur? Well, we only have the data in the in the nuclear pop station site. So whatever the, the data we get, as far as the radio, radioactive things related, and then emission, water, and air emission, we open every data. Before that, well, it's just started. Before that, we picked up some of the a big change or a new release, but um, um, people people didn't like us to pick up. So um, it's kind of a difficult decision for me as as president because it, um, I want the people in the power plant think or make judgment if this is uh, necessary data. Or oh, this is uh, data which needs explanation, but um, just just disclose everything. Um, I wonder if that action might uh, take their decision making knowledge um, ability away from. But uh, still, uh, media was really really harsh on us about the, the disclosure policy. So oh, I decided to um, let make everything open. So it's kind of the, you know, the, for the recipient of the data, it's a huge, vast data. So um, I think, I think it's, it's inconvenient for them to, you know, this is just a release of the data, 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 data. and. Um, but still, uh, I, I chose because that the media, media didn't allow us to select the data, uh, disclose or not. Yeah. Um, Shu. So thank you for coming to SIM today. Uh, I'm thinking, uh, what do you think is the most important factor as a leader to overcome this catastrophic situation? So like. That's a good question. Um, well, I don't know. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to speak generally, because uh, there aren't many people have this kind of the situation, right? 
And uh, my case, I love Tokyo Electric Power Company very, very much. And um, when, I, when I asked to be, a, be president three years ago, I didn't want to uh, leave TEPCO as it was, was really bad, worse than now. And so um, I, wanted, I, I accepted that offer. And um, yes, um, <coughs> yes, um, yes, it's a good question. Um, um, but, well, even this difficult time, as I have, sometimes I have really great moment. Uh, that was, uh, that is, uh, that, that, that my colleagues, uh, seem to be a uh, little bit happier than before. And then um, people realize that we are moving forward. We made some progress. And so um, to be a, a leader of this kind, uh, don't, I don't think it's, not, it's good to, 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 to show that uh, happiest dream to employees. I think we better uh, show the reality. You know, it's kind of the, we need religions, you know. We need, we, we, we have to resile. So in order to have a strong uh, religion power, don't, don't, you know, give them a uh, you know, rosy, sweet dream. You know, just wait, wait for another year. It'll be, it'll be fantastic, that kind of things. Maybe it works only a few days a week or so. But people started realizing the reality. So in, instead, I'd, I'd rather uh, talk the reality and then share the reality. And then, of course, it, uh, um, as I said, that sharing the goal is also very important. Not, not just a dream, it's goal. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I made them much more, many more things that I have to do as president, but um, yeah. And one of the things that I'm, that makes me happy is that uh, sometimes the, my people say that uh, because you are the president, I can be, that I can still work for this company. That, that's the most pleasant comment, happy comment, happy time for me. Thank you. It's, sorry, this is a very emotional thing said. As well. Being here, <coughs> Rasa san, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to hear you again. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that after the accident, uh, you said that the press was very hard on TEPCO. You also mentioned that uh, for the employees itself, it was a very difficult time. With the deregulation coming up, the image is very, very important as you go forward. So what are some of the steps that TEPCO is taking to, to sort of uh, rebrand uh, that image and to gain that trust again? Um, what is it that you're doing and how much do you think is is the right amount to do, because you don't want to probably overstep, I guess, and show too much of free branding. Yes. Um, we, the Japanese electric power market will be deregulated fully in next April. We only have 11 months. Um, of course, the Japanese electric, electric market had been uh, deregulated uh, starting from the year 2000, but that the household market is still regulated now. And then it will be open uh, in next April. So 
Um, as you said, uh, our reputation is really bad. Um, it's a really bad timing for us. Um, but I try to think this positively because it, it, it's deregulated, it, you know, because it's regulated. Our electric tariff was, you know, regulated. So we, we could not raise tariff or we, we could not easily re reduce our tariff. And if, if, if we make a huge profit, we have to um, reduce, we have to get down the, our tariff uh, regulatory. So, um, but um, once it is open, it deregulated. Although that uh, we have to be very competitive. But um, if we win the competition, and we can we can we can make money, and um, as as Art explained, I changed to be a marketing guy after being his TA. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> well, I like to be, uh, um, you know, make every effort. To, to for our customers, and um, although that we of course we lose market because of the, our share is hundred percent, it can be one hundred two or one hundred three, right? So it's going to down definitely, and otherwise you know it's going down. But still, still, and then uh, there there must be a people that who hate Tep Tepco. I know you know. But still, this is also the, the, the positive thinking, but um, even Toyota has its own market share, maybe, I don't know, less than 50%, right? So um, I, even if we lose 20% of our customer, 80% of the share is, is, is something. So um, yeah, we, we tend to be, uh, you know, monopolized um, mind. So if I lose one percent, I would be shocked, right? I may s I, I commit suicide because it, it's, it's the market share goes down. But it's it's a, it's, it's a competition. And then also I I'm saying to my people that uh, if I lose if we lose customers, we can take them back. Next year, this is not uh, you know you know the one story. You know the, the usually the, the electric uh, the, the the contract of the electricity is one year contract. So even if we can, if even if we lose customers, we can take them back. So um, well, this is a well, how, well. There are many 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 things. You know operational tactics and then strategy to, to appeal customers. And uh, one of them is um, we uh, present uh, varieties of uh, menu uh, rate making system and then let them choose. And one of the most uh, disappointing thing for the customer uh, is that uh, there, there is no choice. They, they, they can't choose other company other than Tepco, you know. So um, let them, let them choose. Even if they spent, you know, million dollar to buy Mercedes, they would be happy to have Mercedes, right? So I want. I want to show them a wide varieties of the menu, and then hopefully they pick up one of them, one of our menus. Thank you. Yes, question. 
Uh, so you mentioned that you learned a lot of valuable lessons through the disaster and the aftermath, and that you hope that it'll that these will create a safer nuclear environment uh, for the entire world. So. How are you communicating these lessons learned to other players in the market elsewhere in the world to ensure that not only does this not happen to TEPCO again, but uh, nuclear operators across the planet? Yes, um, as I said, uh, we are very much grateful for the support, technical support and assistance from all over the world, particularly from the United States. Um, but uh, our financial position was not very good, so we could not return something. But uh, I think that the, the most important things that we could return to other new operators is uh, the lesson. So, the, so that the, we, we have been trying to disclose everything. We welcome people to see our plants. Many people actually came uh, and observed the situation. We, we opened uh, data as much as possible. And then we need their cooperation too. So um, there aren't many things that we could offer at this moment, but uh, let them know, let them um, obtain the lesson that we are learning, the same lessons. So um, um, yeah, we, we, we try to open and we try to welcome everybody from, from all over the world. Yes, um, Mr. Yang. So you mentioned uh, uh, TEPCO is building a new nuclear power plant. And uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, what's the decision behind that? And uh, uh, have you looked at other ways to uh, generate power? And do you think that uh, nuclear is the sole solution for Japan, for, for your company? Well, sorry, my, my, my explanation probably was long, wrong. Uh, we are not making a new, new uh, nuclear power station. We are trying to restart the, the existing plant, which stopped operation after the accident. And um, uh, building new one probably is really difficult for us for the time being because the people and media do not allow us to do, the, to do that. I don't know, maybe 10 years after, I don't know. But at this moment, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So what we are trying to do is, is to restart the existing plants of our own. And then, uh, like the United States and, and other uh, countries, we are um, introducing uh, renewable power very much, as much as possible. And um, just a week ago, government uh, announced the new mix of uh, uh, resources. According to that, 22 to 24 percent of generation comes from renewable. And on the, on the other hand, 20 to 22 percent comes from nuclear. So um, as a uh, operator, as a uh, uh, electric power company, uh, to supply electricity stably, is our job number one. So in order to do so, I think um, we need uh, wider varieties of the resources, as, as many as possible. So if we announce to the world, we're not gonna operate nuclear power, it's stupid. Because it, uh, the price of the gas, price of, price of the price of oil, Will, will, will go up for us because everybody knows that we don't, we, don't, we don't operate nuclear power. We have to rely on fossil fuel, obviously. So it's not strategically 
a clever way to do that. We, we better, because of the, as you know, Japan do not have uh, uh, indigenous uh, resources, not like the United States. We don't have shale gas. So um, we, have to, we have to import fossil fuel. At this moment, typical the generation, 93% uh, comes from fossil fuel, you know, thermal power plants. Only 7 or 8% are renewable, including hydro. Uh, it used to be uh, 75, 78% come, came from nuclear. So it's, it's kind of well balanced. So what if something bad happens in Middle East? And what if something bad happens on the sea lane from the Homes, homes trade to Japan. So this is a strategic um, thing. And then this is very much related to national security. So we better have a wider varieties of the sources. So um, of course the renewable is possible, but uh, as you know that we can't rely on, heavily rely on nuclear, I mean uh, uh, wind power or solar power. In order to back up them, we need thermal power plants because they could uh, adjust their you know, power capacity easily. So that uh, you better think that uh, if there is uh, renewable power, like hydro, I mean, uh, uh, no, non hydro, hydro uh, winds or uh, solar power. Behind that, you need to have thermal power station to back up. So um, it's really difficult to, to uh, have a huge amount of uh, renewable, renewable power. And even in Germany, they have a really good wind conditions. But still, they only have 15% or something like that. So our goal is 22 to 24 percent. It's very, very difficult, ambitious uh, target, I would say. Other questions? Um, yes. Uh, I'm curious about energy efficiency in Japan. Mm -hmm. The Japanese people are famous for being incredibly energy efficient, and I'm wondering, after Fukushima, do you think there's room to become even more efficient? Do you see kind of that low-hanging fruit regrow again, or has it reached a point where you can't get more energy from efficiency anymore? A good, good question. Um, I don't know the efficiency, but it's, it's really difficult to improve efficiency immediately by the, the people on the street, right? But at the energy saving is concerned, they start using electricity less and less and less and less. And have you been to Tokyo? Um, in Tokyo, when you go to, say, department store or luxury boutiques, it's bright. You need sunglasses. <laughs> but uh, after the accident, uh, the, the, the level of air conditioners, uh, um, you know, so, so moderated. And then customers by themselves uh, claim this is too, too cold or too bright, that kind of things. So people uh, conserve energy very much. They don't, and then also um, uh, LED kind of things. Um, well, lights uh, consists of a huge proportion of the uh, consumption of electricity. It's it's uh, it's bigger than probably you think. I would say twenty percent or so. Uh, is used for lighting. 
And um, by using LED, you know, it, it reduces the huge amount of the consumption. So and then the, the price of the LED uh, went down very much. So it, it's it's really easy to easy available, you know, everybody. So uh, I don't know that the efficiency. Um, of course, LED LED is a the, the one of the um, way to uh, to improve the efficiency. But uh, well, as far as uh, people um, in uh, in Tokyo or in Japan, they they save um, electricity very much. And then um, before the accident, our peak demand our peak demand uh, comes in summer, hot summer day afternoon. Um, our peak demand was um, six six hundred gig. How do you sixty gigawatt? But uh, after the accident, it for some for some reason I don't know. It's not all all from the say energy saving. Probably the economy helped something, but that our peak is went down to 50. So almost 20 percent. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for spending time talking with us today. I'm interested to know if going into the response to this crisis, if there were any kind of individuals or organizations that you had identified that you wanted to kind of model your response after, um, any particular leaders or, or companies that you'd seen and, and you thought did a, did a good job of responding that you thought would be um, beneficial to emulate? Well, crisis management? Well, I don't know, probably not. Because uh, this is an incredible, you know, accident, and um, particularly that the nuclear is something different from, you know, Exxon Mobil or BP oil spill, that kind of the accident. You know, you people cannot see radiation. Right, it's, it's invisible threat. So uh, people are really worried about that. And even if it's not um, very much contaminated, you could eat fish or rice or whatever, but the people, the consumer, stop buying those things from Fukushima. Uh, how do you say that? I don't know the English, but uh, those uh, rumor-based uh, damage uh, is huge. And no matter how much the government said this is safe, this is lower than the, uh, you know, some, some level, and WHO level or something like that, people do not buy things uh, from Fukushima. So, um, uh, well, I, if, I wish I had some models that I could, I could follow, but um, so far, I, I don't know. This is, this is very different, and particularly in, in Japan, the nuclear is, is something, and uh, people have, have kind of allergic, uh, and then... Um, Media had been really, really harsh on us. So, well, it's, it's, I wish I had uh, some model <laughs> and then I could follow. Sorry. Yes, in the back. Uh, thank you for coming today. Uh, looking, up, looking back at 2011, there are a lot of criticism on TEPCO, including mm -hmm management, mm -hmm. but after you become a president, mm -hmm. you made a good progress so far. So mm -hmm. if you have been a president at the time of the catastrophe, uh, what would you do? Do you think you could change the situation? If I were the president at... <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Of course, that uh, I couldn't stop this accident. Of course, no, nobody, you know, you know, it's it, uh, that tsunami once every thousand years. Uh, but um, well, looking back, uh, you know, we are. Um, we have been checking what, what, what was wrong, and you know, and we started finding we could have done, done that, we could have done this, that kind of things. But still, even we knew, now we knew what we should have done. Still, it's really difficult uh, for us to do that, because now we could say anything. I we could have, we should have done this before. We should have, but it's, um, um, I don't know. But um, maybe uh, the uh, the communication, as far as the communication is concerned, maybe maybe I could have done a little bit better. Because that um, was really, we are really bad communicator. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> I think we're just about out of time. Um, I wanted to thank Hiroshi san for coming today. I think it's clear after his talk uh, how much we appreciate his openness. And also, I think it's clear why he was asked to be president during this difficult time. So thank you very much for coming.